can you please help me welcome uh, Elizabeth um, for her talk on Kalman filters. She works at the New York Times. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Elizabeth. I work as a software engineer at the New York Times. And today we're going to talk about Kalman filters for non-rocket science. So uh, a little background, the Kalman filter. Uh, it's an algorithm named after Rudolf Kalman. And it's basically a predictor corrector technique by which we calculate recursively a system state at time tk. Uh, using only uh, the state at previous time step UK minus one. We're going to explain that later. And we only use the previous step and the new information that comes to the system. So if you're interested of the details of this, uh, you can read here in this uh, address the original paper that was published in 1960. And nothing really has changed a lot from 1960, so. Um, this is a picture of Rudolf Kalman receiving the National Medal of Science on October 7 in, <clears throat> in 2009 from President Barack Obama at the White House, just to remark how important has been the Kalman filter on science development. Um, okay, so first let's talk about a uh, common filter for rocket science. So the common filter was first applied to the problem of trajectory uh, estimation for the Apollo space program of NASA in the 1960s. And then uh, it was incorporated on Apollo space navigation computer. It is also being used in the guidance and navigation system of the NASA Space Shuttle and the altitude control and navigation systems of the International Space Station. So um, in other words, this is the Kalman filter is mostly used for positioning and navigation systems, AKA rocket science. So uh, there is a transcription of the Cal the original Kalman filter code used for Apollo 11 guidance uh, computer, uh, and it's available for public domain. Uh, just check this URL out, and uh, it was implemented in the 1960s uh, using AGC4 assembly language. AGC stands for Apollo guidance computer, so it was using like very low-level assembly instructions like. Uh, count, compare, and skip, CCS, transfer to storage, um, clear and add, and so on. So this is how the code for the original Kalman filter looks like. So it's assembler, if you understand it, like good for you. <laughs> um, uh, then let's talk about Kalman filters for non-rocket science. So the Kalman filter can also be used for some time of forecasting problems for some specific time series that can be modeled as a time varying mean with additive noise. So uh, this is because the Kalman filter is a generalization of the least squares model. So let's start with the formulation of the least squares model and the normal equation. Uh, let's say that we have a linear system represented by A U equals B, where A is the matrix of equations, U are representing our unknowns, and B are a vector representing our measurements. So uh, we need to solve for U. So I think that most of us in college, uh, we know the case where A is a square matrix in which we have the same number of unknowns and the same number of equations. So under other number of conditions, we know that we can invert A and solve for U. So we can have U equals A inverse B, uh, but what if A is not a square matrix? What is this if it's rectangular? Because we have more equations than unknowns. So the number of rows in this case, M is bigger than N. So we can't solve this system as we normally know 
because we can't invert A because it's a rectangular matrix. So we say about this system that it's overdetermined. Uh, we have too many equations at, and too few unknowns. So we are trying to fit M measurements by a small number of parameters M. I think this is better illustrated by an example. Let's say uh, we might have 100 points that fit a straight line, but the system equation for a line is just CX plus D. So we only need to solve the system for two parameters, which are C and D, but we're solving 100 equations with two unknowns. So this is a problem. So what we can do for this system, for this overdetermined system, is that we can find the best estimate for you. We cannot find an exact solution, but we can find an estimate uh, by minimizing the uh, squared error. So each equation introduces an error, and the total squared error is here, E, uh, B minus A dot the U estimate represented by the U hat square. So uh, let's try to do something here. Let's try to multiply both sides of the original equation by A transpose. So uh, we have in the left hand side uh, A transpose A U hat equals A transpose B. Uh, and this is known as the normal equation. Uh, the good thing now is that A transpose A is now a square matrix. We can check the dimensions here. Um, we know that A transpose is N by M, A is M by N, and N A transpose A is N by N. So if the original A has independent columns, that means that columns are not a linear combination of each other. Uh, now A transpose A is invertible, and we can solve for the estimate you had that uh, minimizes the square error. So uh, our solution here now is going to be u hat equals a transpose a inverse a transpose b. So this is how uh, least squares work. Um, we need to introduce errors because when you take measurements, we get errors. So uh, let's talk a little bit about covariance matrix. So let's run an experiment at once. So the error of the each measurement uh, might be independent, or there might be some correlation between errors because uh, simply the, the measurements were taken by the same device or something like that. So uh, we're going to consider the case when errors are independent and the covariance matrix represented by a big sigma here. Uh, this covariance matrix is going to be a diagonal because the expected value of different errors the product of different errors like EI and EJ is going to be zero. So we're going to have a diagonal matrix. And uh, II entries on the diagonal are going to be uh, sigma I square, which is the expected value of the square of the error. So this matrix is going to be always symmetric and it's going to be always positive definite because the variance of uh, sigma I square is necessarily positive, and we know that positive definite matrices has nice properties. So because of this, it can be shown that the choice of this C equals big sigma inverse uh, minimizes the expected error in estimation of U hat. This C is called the weighting matrix, and the normal equation, including now this weighting matrix, is going to be like the weighted normal equation, A transpose C A U hat equals A transpose C B. Now we can solve for the estimate U hat. So when, in this case, when sigma square is equal to one and uh, sigma I J is equal to zero, that means that our error has zero mean and unit variance. The problem becomes just ordinary least squares that we saw before. So uh, we need a little bit more background for the formulation of the Kalman filter. So we need to talk about recursive leads squares. Let's use an example for illustrating this. 
So let's say we have the average of 99 numbers, uh, B1, B2, through B99, and the average is going to be U hat 99. So let's say that a new number, B100, arrives. So how to find the new average, U hat 100, without adding all over again? I'm pretty sure that this problem came up when I took the GRE test, and I didn't know how to solve it. But OK. Uh, so we want to use only the old average, U hat 99, and the new data, B100. So we have two ways to express this. The first way is uh, U hat 100 equals 99 over 100 the old average plus 1 over 100, the new measurement. Or the second way to express that is how we say here, uh, is U99 plus 1 over 100, B100 minus U99. So we like better the second form because it's presented as an update to the previous uh, U hat 99. So here in this equation, we called this expression B100 minus uh, U hat 99. We call this the innovation uh, because it tells us how much information is contained in the new measurement B100. So you can see that if B100 is equal to U hat 99, there's no new information in the new data. So the innovation is zero, and the average doesn't really change. Um, the other important part is this fraction, uh, 1 over 100, which is called the gain factor. And in part, this is where the filter terminology comes from, uh, because it's an input modulated but again, by a gain factor. OK, just a little bit more math. Um, Let's generalize the example of the average to the same linear system we saw before, uh, AU equal B. Uh, so let's just start by from an old uh, estimate we have uh, for the equation A old, U equals B old. So when new information arrives, uh, let's see it's called A new or B new, we add a new row to a old and you row to be old. And the solution of this new system that you can see, like in the second row, um, is going to lead to uh, a new estimate you knew. So uh, we don't want to solve this entire system every time a new information comes in. So, how can we update you all to you new using only a new and b new? So let's back to uh, the normal equation and let's find with this new information uh, a transpose a. Uh, so you can see here that a transpose is this like horizontal matrix. And uh, if we calculate the dot product between these two, it's going to be. A transpose old, A old plus A transpose new, A new. So you can see here that is like a known part plus a new part. Now, if we work on the right hand side of the equation, A transpose B is going to be this A old transpose B old plus A new transpose B new. But we know from the original equation that B old is equal to A old U hat old. So we replace that back into this equation. So using those two expressions for uh, the normal equation and like simplifying, we get this expression for the recursive list squares in this form that we already say that we really like. So it's going to be u hat new is equal to u hat old plus a transpose a inverse a transpose a new transpose uh, b new minus a new B old. So this is uh, the expression for recursive list squares. So we can see here that the gain matrix is going to be A transpose A inverse A new transpose. Uh, and it's often denoted by K for Kalman, obviously. 
So if we go back to the average problem, we have um, the least square solution for 99 equations and one unknown that is going to be this u, the average. So the A matrix in this case is going to be a column vectors with just ones. And the, when the 100 equation comes in, so it's a new measurement, u equals b100, that's b new. So the only thing we need to do is add a new row to a new, which is going to be a new one. And if, you, if we apply the recursive list squares expressions for this, we're going to get this expression that is the same that we have previously found. So in this case, we could have had um, a weighting matrix to measure the reliability of uh, u hat. Uh, but in this example, the 100 equations were equally reliable and had the same unit variance. So this is why the, the C, the covariance matrix, doesn't show up here. So now, finally, we have enough elements to discuss uh, the Kalman fil filter formulation. So let's see how it works for forecasting in time series. So the common filter is basically a time varying least squares problem. So in discrete time, we produce an estimate uk hat at each time tk. So the whole idea of the common filter is updating our best least square estimate of a state vector u hat after new observations comes in. So uh, we want to compute like the change to update what we predicted. Um, so this will work if we can express the new estimate as a linear combination of the old estimate, u old, and the new observation be new. So we can see like here like how the linear combination should be. u new equals some l uh, dot u old plus some k dot be new. So there are some nice features of the Kalman filter that are important to our implementation. So first is that the Kalman filter is recursive. We don't store at all observations be old because those measurements are already used in the estimate you old had. So normally the state vector u is much shorter than the measurement vector b which is growing in length with each measurement. So this filter is efficient in this sense. So um, we can write the linear combination for the common filter as we say, like we, we see in the second point. Uh, u new is going to be u old plus a gain matrix that multiplies our uh, innovation. So. Again, the innovation between old estimates and new measurements are modulated by the gain matrix. So the reliability of u hat of our estimate is given by the error covariance matrix P that tells the statistical properties of u hat based, based on the statistical properties of the measurements B. So we see here that our covariance matrix P is going to be A transpose C A inverse. So uh, in the Kalman filter implementation, we also need to update the covariance matrix when a new uh, measurement B new arrives because it like includes uh, new information for the covariance. So um, let's present the algorithm here. Uh, I mean, there's some other steps before coming to this algorithm for prediction correction. Uh, it's based basically in the, the property of A transpose C A is a tridiagonal matrix. So the forward elimination to solve the system is going to be a recursion, and the back substitution is going to be another recursion. Uh, the forward recursions find the best estimate of the final state, 
and very often that's all we need because we don't really need to calculate back substitution and we are not going to do back substitution here because back substitution just adjust earlier uh, estimates to account for later measurement. So this process is called the smoothing and it produces the correct solutions to the normal equation, but we're not going to do smoothing today, uh, just the forward uh, recursion. So the forward recursion is a two-step process, prediction and correction. Uh, for a prediction, we will use all the information we have through time, k minus one, to generate the prediction. Then when a new measurement comes at time k, uh, we're going to add a correction. So putting all this together, the common filter produces the final state u hat k given k. Um, so we can see here for prediction how we predict uh, u k given k minus 1. So that's a prediction like taking in account all information we have up to time k minus 1. Uh, we have here the, this F matrix is called the state transition matrix. It establishes how the state vector changes from one time step to another. Uh, this, the F matrix is like really particular to the specific system we're trying to solve. Um, and then we have the expression for the estimate of the covariance matrix given the old information. Um, we have here a Q which is the covariance matrix of the system error. This is going to be because every time we add a new equation, uh, we add an error that is different from the error uh, of the measurement. So the system error is going to be Q. Uh, so for the correction, we need to calculate the gain matrix, which is K using the, the prediction of the of the covariance matrix, and then we use the gain matrix K to update our predictions of UK now given K, because we now have the new measurement at time K and the covariance matrix at time K. So finally, we're going closer to the code. So as mentioned in the abstract for this talk, NumPy uh, we'll provide all the core linear algebra we need for prediction and updates, and also the data structure to hold all the equations of a state. So let's implement two functions for the prediction and correction steps. Uh, we want to calculate the following variables at each step. The predicted mean and covariance of the state, that's predicted U and predicted P, before the measurement comes in, the estimated mean and covariance of the state after the measurement, the corrected one, the innovation, and the filter gain. So um, this is the data that we require for making a prediction. We require the previous state vector U, the previous covariance matrix P, the state transition matrix F, and the process noise covariance matrix Q. So this is like extremely simple. Is it clear? Uh, OK. Um, so it's going to be a predictive step. It's just going to uh, calculate the dot product uh, between the transition matrix and the old estimate for the state and it's going to calculate the, the covariance matrix using the state error and, uh, and also the F matrix, and we return both of these. The correction step requires the predicted state and covariance, the A matrix, which is like our matrix of observation equations. Now we account for B, which is which can be on a scalar or a vector of observations at, at time k, uh, the, um, the covariance matrix of the system, and the covariance matrix of error in observations. So again, this is really simple. 
uh, the correct step is going to calculate first this C that is given by the Kalman filter update formula. And then we compute the Kalman gain matrix, which is this K here. And finally, we add the correction to predicted state and to the covariance matrix. So this is really simple. So how we simulate this? So we want to initialize all our data structures and run the prediction correction for some number of iterations. And at the end, we want to compare the predicted and corrected state with the actual measure that came into the system. So here, I'm going to just have a time step of 0.1. I'm going to have this A matrix that is representing some equations. Uh, I'm going to initialize my state vector with zeros. And we're going to use some random measurements, but centered at the state value, like the predicted state value. So we're going to use uh, random numbers that returns a sample from the standard distribution in accordance to the unit variance we're using here for Q and R, just for the sake of simplicity. So we are going to run this uh, 100 times. Uh, we're going to store our prediction, corrections, and measurements on this list. Uh, we're just going to run predict, correct, and generate a new uh, measurement at the end of the loop. So we're printing here the predicted final estimate, the corrected final estimate after the new measurement came in, and the actual measured state. So for this system, we predicted uh, minus 23.41. We corrected and looked at the prediction is not that bad. So it's, it's kind of useful here. So this is really useful, for example, when you're using your GPS and you go through a tunnel or you don't have signal, but you keep like observing that the GPS is working and it's just because the system is predicting the, the next state. Uh, so in this plot, uh, we can see that the prediction is on circles, the correction is on axes, and the, measure, the actual measurement is on uh, triangles. So it's interesting that the correction is always between the prediction and the, measure, the measurement. So I don't remember why, but that's the, the, the correct way for this. So conclusions. Uh, we have seen that the Kalman filter is a viable forecasting technique for time series, uh, for some specific time series that can be modeled in a certain way and that is not limited to, to rocket science. And Kalman filter is like really similar to least square method, but it has some computational advantages in terms of efficiency. So almost everything in this talk has been extracted from the book Computational Science and Engineering by Gilbert Strang. Gilbert Strang is the guy in the picture. Uh, so if you feel like getting deeper into common filters, I recommend to go to his book or to the videos available at MIT Open Courseworks. So there are also some obviously available packages for common filters that take into account other information like uh, correlated errors and some, some other informations like PyCalman. So again, if you want to check this and better understand, just download PyCalman or go to Gilbert Strand book, whatever you want. And, um, okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I hope it, this, is, this wasn't like too heavy on math and too light on Python, but I hope you enjoyed the talk and let me know afterwards if you have any questions. This is my email address. Yeah. Um, 
and my Twitter account, so just feel free to get in touch. That's it. <laughs>